good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Going to finish up our special study on Ears to Ear, part two tonight. Remember, we learned that there is a group known as God's elect, and they have eyes to see and ears to hear, when many people do not. And we read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, that they were chosen before the foundation of this world. And we talked about how that word foundation is katabo, and it refers to the destruction of the first earth age, when God destroyed that age that's going to come up again in this study. But what, why did God destroy the first earth age? You learn in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, and in Ezekiel chapter 28, that Satan rebelled, and he drew a third of God's children to worship him. A third of God's children left God and decided they wanted to make Satan their God. So what did God do? He destroyed that entire age and brought about this second earth age where he put all of our souls in these flesh bodies so everyone gets to make a decision. Do you want to follow God or do you want to follow Satan? But there is that group known as God's elect. They were chosen before God destroyed that first earth age. So no doubt they stood with God against Satan. And that's why they were chosen. And we read in, in Romans chapter 8 how they were predestinated. And it, said that, it says that there is a group that God foreknew. And what does that mean that he foreknew them? It means he knew them from the time before. He knew them in the time of that first earth age because they stuck with him. They were loyal. They didn't fall away to the wicked one. And what does it say there? It's, it's Romans chapter 8 about verse 28 through 30. It says that he foreknew them and that they were called, they were predestinated, they were justified, and they were glorified. They were justified in that first earth age. And that's why it says in that Romans chapter 8 that the Holy Spirit will intercede in their lives. God will put them exactly where He wants them to bring, to bring His plan to pass. And we learned what their destiny is in, Re in um, Romans chapter 11 verse 4. God said, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who will not bow a knee to the image of Baal. That's the 7,000 gods elect who will not be deceived when Satan arrives on this earth claiming to be God. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, Satan and his fallen angels will be cast out onto this earth. And it's to deceive the whole world. But you read in multiple places, Revelation 13, verse 8, and many others, God's elect will not be deceived. And their destiny is to, be, to refuse the false Christ and to be delivered up before him and to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them. Understand, that is your destiny. If you understand God's Word, if you can see the simplicity, your destiny is to stand against the false one and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. And also remember, it said in that uh, Romans chapter 11, it says that most have not obtained what they seek for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Because there is one unforgivable sin, and that's the only one of God's elect can commit that. And if they are delivered up before the false Christ, they know he's Satan, but they decide to bow the knee. They decide they want to worship Satan instead of God, fully understanding that he is Satan. That's unforgivable. So the rest were blinded, so they cannot commit that sin. And we read in John chapter 15 where Christ speaking to, to the people. He said, look, I came and I spoke to these people. I gave them the truth. So, so there's no cloak, there's no excuse for their sin. So that's why God blinded many. But you, God's elect, that have ears to hear, you do have a destiny. So let's finish this study and let's ask the word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word and for giving us understanding. We thank you for giving us this building we have that we can come and teach your word exactly as it's written. And we just ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, we're going to begin our study in the book of Isaiah, chapter 29. We're going to pick it up. Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 9. Isaiah 29, verse 9. And it reads, Stay yourselves and wonder. That, that stay yourselves, that means that you don't, don't just go quickly and follow anyone that claims to be religious. That means you hesitate is what, the, what that means in the Hebrew. It means you test the spirits. 
you hesitate, you be reluctant to follow someone just because they claim to be a preacher. You check them out in God's word. So stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. Now that little phrase, cry ye out and cry, I think that that should be translated, their eyes are closed. Now you check me out in your Strong's Concordance and you make up your own mind, but I think that would be the better translation. Their eyes are closed. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. What are they drunken with? With false doctrine, with false teaching, with the ways of a church system instead of learning the Word of God. And that word stagger, it means to waver. Just going from one doctrine to the next. Just like a reed shaking in the wind. That they don't have any foundation. They don't stick to the truth. But anytime they hear something that sounds religious, they want to go after it. And, and make a note of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. What does it say there? It says, Be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the fraud and cunning craftiness of man, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You be real careful. That's why I said stay yourselves. Be reluctant. Be real careful. Don't take my word or any other man's word for what they say. Do not be like a weed, like a reed shaken in the wind. You stay on that rock solid foundation of God's word only. And that little phrase in that Ephesians chapter 4, 14, that word, that little phrase, cunning craftiness, it means that they are very skilled in seeming religious. And that they are very skilled in making something sound reasonable when it's an absolute falsehood. I mean, the false preachers, they are real skilled in making something sound real good. But it's a complete lie. So you be real careful and you stick to God's word only. Verse 10. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers... The seers hath he covered. That's to say those who claim to be prophets, those who claim to be the so righteous super preachers. But you see, if they don't teach God's word, they're just a false prophet. God said, I shut their eyes. You don't want to listen to someone with closed eyes, spirit, with spiritual eyes. Verse 11. And the vision of all has become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot. For it is sealed. There's so much wisdom in this verse. Do you know what that word vision is? Check that out in your Strong's Concordance. It means a revelation. How many times have you heard people say, the book of Revelation is sealed? Well, that's not sure not what God's word says. The very third verse in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, it says, blessed are those that read it and understand it, the words of this prophecy. You would rather listen to some guy that told you you don't have to read it rather listening to God's word. So this is saying there are people that they want to know the truth. So they go to their preacher, but then he tells them it's not meant to be understood. He says, don't worry about revelation. Don't worry about studying too deep in God's word. All you got to do is believe. Have you never read in the book of James how faith without works is dead? Let's go another verse. Verse 12. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I have not learned. So the person that wants to understand, he went to his preacher. His preacher didn't understand. So he tried to go to somebody else that maybe is not a preacher, but sure claims to love God. But, he, but then he says, I'm not learned. I haven't studied. I just love God. But he never takes the time to study God's word. And that's why we're in the state that we're in in the world today. So many churches, just the vast majority of churches, they leave out studying God's Word. They don't teach it chapter by chapter and verse by verse exactly as it's written. So, and what does it say in Amos chapter 8, verse 11? It says there's a famine coming, and we're in that famine. But it's not for bread, nor for thirst for water, but for hearing the words of the Lord. And it says in the next verse that a man will go from one end of the earth to the other, and he can't hardly find it. Because God's word is rarely taught. Verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Don't ever forget that verse. I mean, these people, they claim to be so religious. So holy. I mean, they, their church, I mean, is just a beautiful thing. 
But you see, who, and this has nothing to do with any certain people. It just has to do with, do you, do you learn by the precepts of men? Or do you learn by the Word of God? I mean, people, they really think that they got it going on because of the, the religious traditions that they take part in. God says, they draw near me with their mouth. They claim to be real close to me. But they study the precepts of men. That's the traditions. Instead of the Word of God. So guess what? Their eyes are shut. But they think they're doing everything so perfectly. One more verse here, verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. The ones that they claim to be so prudent, they claim to be so righteous, claim to have so much wisdom. That's all going to be done away with. Check out this word marvelous. It means to separate. God is going to separate those who truly love Him and study His word from those who just play church. And, and how is He going to do that? What's, the, what's this work that He's going to perform? He's going to cast the false Christ out onto this earth. That's going to test you out. Have you studied God's word exactly as it's written? To know the false one is going to arrive first. Or did you just play games? You just played religion. That's how God separates the sheep from the goats. And how blessed are you going to be, those of you that do take time to study God's Word. So let's continue our study on this ears to hear. I want to go to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. We're going to go Matthew chapter 13, picking it up, verse 1. And do you, do you know what it says about this chapter? In, um, it, this is the parable of the sower. And you, you know what is said about this in Matthew chapter 13? It, it's in, in, in Mark chapter 4, which is also the parable of the sower. You know what it says there in Mark chapter 4? It says that if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to be able to understand any of God's parables. That tells you how absolutely important this is, and it is so very simple. So let's study it exactly as it's written and learn what God wants us to see from this. And so let's just go right into it. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. And it reads, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And then this place has been found. This made a natural amphitheater. I mean, there was a giant crowd, and people pretty far off could hear him. Verse 3. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Remember, if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand any of God's parables. And I'm not going to say a whole lot during while we read the parable. You know why? Because if right after that, Jesus Christ interprets the parable for us. And when God interprets something, you don't want to mess with it. So let's read in the parable of the sower, Matthew chapter 13, verse 4. And understand that the, the sower, he's sowing the word of God. That's what this has to do with. It has to do with broadcasting. And for actual seed, when, when you sow the seed, you throw the seed. So you don't know exactly where it's going to land. And that's how it is when you, when you teach God's word. When, it, when it's to a big group of people, where it, whether it's in one place or whether it's on television or wherever it's on the internet or whatever. The point is you teach the word, but you don't know where, where that's going to land at. So that's what, that's what we're going to learn about. Matthew chapter 13, verse 4. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith, that means immediately, they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. Verse 7. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. When, you can't help but think of Judges chapter 9, the very first parable in God's word when you read about those thorns. Verse 8. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit. Some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. And who God gives much, he expects much. Let's go to another verse. Verse 9. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Those of you that have ears to hear and have understanding, God's saying, you pay attention. Verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Remember, Christ was speaking to the multitude, to all people. 
Now the disciples come to him privately. Why are you only speaking in parables? Verse 11. He, Christ, answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. That word mysteries, it means the divine secret. God's elect are meant to know because God knows they can handle it. They stood against Satan in the first ordained, so they proved themselves. They were justified. God knows they can handle the truth, and they can handle standing against Satan because they already did it before. But as far as everyone else, God doesn't know. He's afraid they might commit the unforgivable sin. So he blinds them for their own protection. It's not meant for them to understand. And that should give you great peace of mind when you're trying to share God's Word. If someone just can't get it, I mean, it's so easy for you. It's so simple. But other people, they just can't get it through their mind. Why? It's because God blinded them. So all our job to do is plant the seed. Only God can make that seed grow. I mean, I mean, God said he blinded them. So what, you, you think that you know better than God? You think you're just going to ram it down their throat until they understand? No, that's not how it works. God's plan is perfect. Let's go to another verse. Verse 12. For whosoever... For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Check out that word hath in your Greek concordance. It means they hold on to it. So it's saying, whoever holds on to that truth that he's given, God is going to pour out more wisdom abundantly. But it says, those who don't hold on to the truth, even the little bit of wisdom he hath, God's going to take it away from them. Why? Because they don't care about it. They don't want to share it with others. Remember, it's not important how much you know. It's important how much you can share with other people in a simple way that they can understand. That's what true wisdom is, teaching the Word of God in a simple way. Because God's Word is not complicated. It is simple. And that's what true wisdom is. So if you hold on to that truth and you share it with others, God is going to give you more wisdom abundantly. Verse 13. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand, that they just can't put it together. Why? Because that's God's plan. Verse 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, that's Isaiah, which saith, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and not perceive. I mean, they, they might hear the truth, but it just does not, doesn't resonate with them. Goes right in one ear and out the other. Fifteen. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes in their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. That word converted means to go back to, and this is Isaiah chapter six, verse nine through ten, being quoted here. And do you remember Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, where it says basically the same thing here. It says that their ears are dull of hearing, and it says that they're just stuck on milk. It says they've been good going to church for so long, they should have been teachers by now, but they have need that someone teach them the very basics over and over and over. No, you learn the meat, you learn the, the very beginning of Christianity, that's the milk. Don't get stuck on it. No, you let that milk, you keep that foundation, and then you start getting fed the meat. You start learning the deeper truths of God's Word. And what does he say? He says he'll pour it out on you abundantly. Uh, but whosoever hath, uh, verse 13, or we're, we're down to verse 15. We're even down to verse 16. Jeez, all right, verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, for they see and your ears, for they hear. I hope you understand how blessed you are if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. Do not ever take that for granted. And don't forget, you don't hide a candle under a bushel. You share that light. You spread the truth. And, and remember, you don't, don't go be a re religious fanatic. But just when you feel led, you plant that seed of truth. Do not hide it under a bushel. Verse 17. For verily, that means for truly, I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. And you see how those little phrases, those things, and, and them are in italics. That means they were added. This probably a better translation would have been translated as him, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of the prophets, they wanted to see the time that the Lord Jesus Christ was the first advent. 
but also the second advent. You see, we can probably even put this into effect today, that many prophets and righteous men wanted to see the second advent. They wanted to be here at that time right before that when the false Christ will arrive, and they wanted to stand against Him. You understand how blessed you are to be living in this generation of the fig tree that began in 1948 when the prophecy of Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 6 was fulfilled, where the good and the bad figs go come to Jerusalem. And what does it say in Mark chapter 13, verse 30, right around there? It says, This generation shall not pass until all be fulfilled. Understand, many righteous men and the prophets wanted to live at this time. And you're given that blessing to be here. Praise God. Verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. Now we, we get the interpretation from Christ himself. So you don't want to mess with it. What, it, what he's going to say, that's why I just read the parable. Because we're going to get the exact interpretation from Jesus Christ himself. Let's read it. Verse 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. I mean, they, they hear the truth, but just like we've been reading, they hear, it, they hear it, but they don't understand. And so they, they might they have just that little bit of truth, that seed was planted, but they don't study any deeper. They don't want to actually do something, dig into the Word. So that's what Satan comes. He just rips it right away, right away from them. How does he do it? I mean, one of Satan's very best tools that he utilizes, he uses false prophets to teach out of pulpits. I mean, teaching people that you're going to rapture away, which is a complete, the, the worst probably wicked doctrine that's ever existed. It's an absolute lie, and we're, that'll, that'll be brought out real clear. It is, it is all throughout God's Word. What does it say in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17? It says that Satan is being cast out onto this earth to make war with those who keep the commandments of God and those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's who he's coming to make war with. Make no mistake, it's a spiritual war. It's all about deception. But you've got to have a lot of people saying, oh no, you're going to be caught away before the false Christ ever comes. A hundred percent lie. They, they, they hear a little bit of truth and then false doctrine just rips it right, right away from them. Why? Because they listen to the precepts of men instead of the word of God. So that's those that received it by the wayside. That's one of the verse, verse 20. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and Anon with joy receiveth it. That word Anon, it means immediately. It says he heard the truth and he understood it. And he was very joyful. He received it. He, he, was, he was so happy that he heard the truth. Now, something that's so much wisdom. I want you to check out that word stony in your, in your Charles Concordance. It's a compound. It's two Greek words put into one. And do you know what it means? It means that, that, that they look like a rock. That means that they appear to be very religious. They appear to be righteous. They appear to have wisdom. You go to church every Sunday. I mean, you, you won't see them. You won't be there on a church Sunday. They're not there. They follow their church to the letter. Well, what about following God and His Word? So they, it looks on the outside like they are standing on the rock of Jesus Christ. But it's only how they look. And they don't actually do it. So, let's go. so he, he hears it. So he's so happy about it at first. But then what? Verse 21. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while... For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. That word by and by means immediately. Anytime someone comes against them just a little bit, a little persecution, a little tribulation, they can't handle it. Well, why do you think they couldn't handle it in the first or days either? That's why God didn't give them the ability to have eyes to see and ears to hear. But they, they can't handle it. They've obviously never read Luke chapter 6 verse 22. I quote that so often it seems like, what does it say? It says, blessed are you when people will hate you and separate themselves from you and cast out your namesake as evil, for great is your reward in heaven. You should be rejoicing when people come against you for sharing God's word. But no, not, not these people. This is a little bit of persecution. They would rather not have truth. And what, what would Paul teach in the epistles? He said, if, if what I did was try to please man instead of God... I am not worthy to be a servant of Christ. It doesn't matter what any man thinks of you or woman, period. 
It only matters what God thinks. Verse 22. And I, I wanted to say that that word offended, the word in the Greek is skandalizo. This means that he is enticed to sin. He's enticed. He, he lets the wicked one, he lets the wicked one utilize another people, and he, he, just, he just can't do it anymore. He's enticed to sin, and it even means to, enticed to apostasy. And that great apostasy is coming. Verse 22. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. I mean, they, they just care too much about the ways of the world. They, they, care about, they care more about money. They care more about their job. They care more about their relationship than they do, the, than they do serving God. What did, what did God say? He said, take up my cross and he said, whoever will, save it, whoever will save his life in the ways of the world, he's going to lose. He's going to lose his spiritual life. But those who, those who put God first above all else, and even maybe have to lose some things in his own life, he has eternal life abiding in him. So you, no matter what, serving God is always the number one priority, and you put everything else way below it. I mean, nothing matters compared to serving the living God. But they start thinking about riches. They start thinking about all the ways of the world. Well, what does the gospel say? It says you cannot serve God and mammon. You've got to pick one. That doesn't mean it's a sin to be rich if you're blessed by God. Job was so rich by the blessings of God. Abraham was so rich by the blessings of God. That was no sin. But they put serving God first. But if you put money and just the whatever you want to do above serving God, that's going to choke you and you're going to lose all the truth that you ever had. Do not let that happen. You always put serving God first in your life. You become unfruitful. Verse 23. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit. And bring it forth, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And like I said before, whom God gives much, He expects much. I mean, whatever, whatever wisdom He gives you, do not just hide it inside yourself. You share that with people who want to listen. Do not cast your pearls before swine. Someone wants to mock you for it. Don't share the word of God with them. It's too precious for that. And don't forget either you cannot put new wine into old wine bottles. If someone is so stuck on their ways, their traditions, they're, they're probably not going to come out of that. But you still, you plant the seed. And if they don't want to hear it, fine. You, you keep on moving. But remember, who God gives much, He expects much. And what a blessing it is. Remember, blessed are those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. Now, verse 24. Something absolutely vital that you must understand. All verses 1 through 23, when you saw the word seed in the English, the Greek word was spiro, and it means to sow or scatter the seed. That changes when we get to verse 24. You know what the word seed is? Every time after in this chapter, the Greek word is sperma. It's the male sperm and the offspring that come with it. So we, we, we change to now we are talking about children. Do not take my word for this. You look at the Strong's and Courts, you look at the word seed. Verses through 1 through 23, it's spiro. Now we come to verse 24, it's now sperma, and we change to the subject being children, sperm, offspring. So let's read it. Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. Another parable put ye forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. And went his way. You could even trick if you wanted to, you could even say, while that, but while men slept, you could even say, while Adam slept. Because that's what this has to do with. This has to do with Genesis chapter 3. What happened in the garden where the serpent, who is Satan, he came and he beguiled Eve. And he sowed his seed there. He planted it. Let's go to another verse, verse 26. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. You understand it? It's, let's go another verse, actually. Verse, uh, verse 27. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath the tares? 28. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. That's the enemy, that's Satan. The servants said unto him, 
Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Saying, do you want us to just get rid of these tares? The children, the offspring of the serpent? And that, that word tares, it's so on. And you see, when, it, when it's first growing up, it looks exactly like wheat. You can't tell the difference. Exactly like you cannot tell the difference between a Kenite and an Israelite. By the way they look. By their skin. But you know them by their fruits. But you know what happens when the fruit starts coming forth of Zawan? It's a, it's a gross, poisonous plant. So they're saying, do you want us to just get rid of all these tares? Get rid of the Kenites? What does Christ say? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Why? Because you cannot tell the difference by the way that they look. Verse, verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather you together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn, the, the wheat that is, of course, Israel, the true seed. That's the seed line through which Jesus Christ would come. But, but you got this other seed line. And make no mistake, the Kenites were born of woman. The word Kenites is a Hebrew word that just means offspring of Cain. Cain being the very first son of the devil. But understand, they were born of woman. So that means even a Kenite, if they love the Lord Jesus Christ, they will live forever. If they convert, if they truly in their heart accept the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as their, as their Savior, they live forever. That's how beautiful the love and the salvation of Jesus Christ is. So yeah, you can't just go get rid of them. I mean, it's been tried before, but it's, it's a big mistake because God said, don't you do it. You can't tell the difference. They don't know the difference between the Kenites and the tribe of Judah. So let's, let's go into the verse. Verse, verse 31. And I want to say, Jesus Christ is also going to, um, he's going to interpret this himself when we get just a few verses. So if you're saying, well, I, I don't know if that's really what it's talking about. Just stick around a few more verses. Christ is going to interpret it himself. And I hope you would trust what Christ teaches. Verse 32, or verse uh, Verse 31, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, that means it's the smallest. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh the tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Do you remember what we learned when we, we're studying the book of Acts right now? Do you remember what we found out? The Christian church first, it was just 120 members. That's all it was. But they had that true faith, that belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And basically day by day, thousands were being added to it. And understand how Christ would teach that if you even have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say, say to a mountain, be cast off into the sea. But what's a mountain? It's symbolic of a nation. So if you have, if you just have the, if you have true one million percent faith, but maybe you don't have any knowledge of God's word at all. But you have, that, you have that true faith. And you begin to search out the truth. That's going to grow up just like a tall tree. You just you continue stay in God's word. Not the traditions of men. But if you have that true faith, God's going to pour out so much wisdom on you, you won't even know what to do with it. Well, you will know because God says to share it. But your cup will run over. But don't overlook the fact it says the fowls, they're going to come and they're going to nest in the branches. That means when you're doing a work for God and you're, you're becoming prosperous, He's blessing it. That, that means that you're, you're getting people to listen to you. You're sharing the truth. The fowls, that means there's going to be wicked people trying to come and bring you down. But what do you know? God's on the throne. So if you are truly teaching God's word exactly as it's written, that doesn't mean you have to be a preacher or anything like that and just share the truth with others. There's going to be people come against you. So be ready for it. But like I said, God's on the throne. If you're truly serving Him with a pure heart, nothing can come against you. What did what we read just a few days ago? If God be for us, who can be against? If God is for us, who, who can be against us? Nobody can. Verse thirty-three. Another parable spake He unto them: The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now, if you're familiar with books like the book of Leviticus and others, you know that leaven is symbolic of sin. So what's this saying? You just let a little bit of leaven get in your church. Man, you just let a little bit of false doctrine creep in. Before you know it, it's going to fill up the whole church. You cannot let false doctrine run wild. 
You stick to the Word of God. But like I said, you just let a little bit, oh, I think I'm going to fly away before the false Christ comes. You just let you let that people start saying that in your church. Before you know it, it's, it's filled the entire church. Do not let that happen. You have to nip it in the bud right away. And anytime someone asks you a question, you make sure you can document exactly what you're saying in God's Word. And you say the same thing if someone comes to you with some stupid doctrine. You say, well, where, where does God's Word say that? And if it's false, guess what? They're not going to have an answer. Hopefully that's going to convict them. But that, you just let a little leaven in. It's going to leaven a whole lump, lump in. And who's the woman? Mystery babbling. What's babbling mean? It means confusion. You let just a little confusion in. That mystery Babylon from what Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. Or you know what false doctrine is going to run wild. And false doctrine does run wild in the world today. But that doesn't affect you because you study God's word. Verse 34. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them. We learn why back in verse 11. It's not meant for some to know. 35. That it might, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying... I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. That's Psalm 78, verse 2. And once again, that word, that word foundation is the kakabo, the destruction of the first earth age. You see, most people, they don't have eyes to see and ears to hear. They don't even know there was an earth age before this. But that secret is kept from them. But that divine secret is given to you because God knows you can handle it. Verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Even they, they weren't quite understanding it. So guess what? Jesus Christ is going to interpret it for us. But don't overlook that. If you don't understand something, ask the Holy, ask God to give you understanding through the Holy Spirit. And he will. Always ask for that understanding. Verse 37, let's get this interpretation and get it nailed down by Christ himself. Verse 37, he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. That's simple enough. 38, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The wicked one is Satan, of course. The tares are his very children. Do you remember in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God spoke to Satan? Remember, his name is the serpent, the devil, the, the Satan. He, he's all those names. What, and what did he say in Genesis chapter 3, 3, verse 15, right after he beguiled Eve? He said to Satan, I will put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. Your seed is going to bruise her seed's heel, meaning it would be the Kenites that would crucify the Lord Jesus Christ. We just read that in Acts chapter 7. But her seed, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to bruise your head. The very crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ did bring about the death sentence of Satan. But he's not dead yet. Not until the end of the millennium. But he said, I will put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. It doesn't need any more interpretation than that. The tares are the children of the wicked one. Verse 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. I mean, if you had any doubt of who this is, he went and he said that an enemy hath done this. He went he knew exactly what he was doing. Let's finish this verse. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Now, now why did Satan do this? Satan was always trying to ruin the birth of Jesus Christ. So, that, that's, so he was trying to make it to where it wouldn't happen. That's why he went and seduced Eve. He knew that through her offspring was going to come the Lord Jesus Christ. So Satan thought he could ruin that. Didn't work. The Lord Jesus Christ killed, still came through the offspring of Adam and Eve, through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob. But then Satan tried again in Genesis chapter 6. He sent the fallen angels down to earth, and they seduced women. And all the families, except for the family of Noah, had mixed with the fallen angels. If Satan would have gotten Noah's whole family to mix with the fallen angels, the birth of, Se the birth of Christ, the seed line, would have been ruined. They would have all intermixed with, the, with these spiritual beings. But no, that's, that's exactly why God brought the flood. That's why he put Moses, or that's why he put Noah and his family on the ark, along with two of, all, of every flesh, of all the races. That's why we're all still here. But Satan tried at every turn to try to ruin the birth of Christ. It would never happen. You know why? Because God's on the throne. 
Verse 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Now what is that word world? It's eon. That's, that's the end of this earth age. That's not until the end of the millennium. The earth does not become rejuvenated until the end of the millennium. And the tares that cannot to, who they choose to follow their father at the end of the millennium, they will be cast into the lake of fire and will be blotted out. But not until then. Verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. Once again, that's how you know it's after the millennium because there's nothing that offends there. There's no tears there. There's nothing that can entice you to sin. Verse 42. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. One more verse here. Verse 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And do you. And you know, you say, look, did you overlook the fact that it says the kingdom of their father? That means the father is present. The Father is not present until the end of the millennium and we come into the third earth age. And make a note of 2 Peter chapter 3. All three earth ages are given there. Now we're, we're going to go to one more place. Let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 3. And some, some of you people ask and say, well, well, why does it matter that we know who the Kenites are? Why does it matter that we know that Satan sowed seed and brought about Cain and brought about that offspring? You're going, to learn that exact, you're going to learn that answer right here from the Word of God. Straight from it. I said this is the last place we're going to go to complete this study. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 3, pick it up in verse 5. Now, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you got seven churches given here. But God's only pleased with two of them. Smyrna and Philadelphia. And why? Because they both teach the same doctrine and they didn't teach false doctrine. They just taught the Word of God exactly as it's written. They taught Matthew 13. They taught Genesis chapter 3 exactly as it was written. Now let, let's go Revelation chapter 3. We're going to pick it up verse 5. Now this, this what, the verse I'm about to read, this is the end of, of Sardis, I believe. But I want to read it because, because it's just an awesome verse. So uh, Revelation chapter 3 verse 5. Now it reads, He that overcometh, the, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, those that white linen that's made of your righteous acts. Revelation chapter 19, verse 8. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Remember, even the Kenai is included in that. If they confess the Lord Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior, they will not be blotted out. Verse 6. He, he that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Those of you with ears to hear that have eyes to see with understanding, saying, you listen up. He's saying, God's elect. Listen up to what Jesus Christ is about to teach. Verse 7. And to, the, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Now, what is that key of David? You know that Jesus Christ came through that sea line of David from the stem of Jesse. This saying that you understand the sea line of Christ and you understand the sea line of Satan. And don't worry, just, just hold on with me. Let's learn from God's Word. So let, let, let's go into the verse, verse 8. And, and notice, it opens doors no man can shut and it shuts doors no man can open. Verse 8, I know thy works, Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and that's a whole lot if it's from Almighty God. And hast kept my word, and has not denied my name. And whenever, you, whenever I read that, hath a little strength, I think of Daniel chapter 11, verse 34, where God says, yeah, it's going to be real tough for you when the false Christ is here, but I'm going to hope in you with a little help, and you're going to be just fine. Verse 9, now listen up. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. I mean, how amazing is that? God's going to make sure everybody knows how much he loves you because you stood with him. Now, remember that they, they claim to be Jews. You know, there's a whole lot of people that say, oh, the Jews are evil, the Jews are money hungry, the Jews are wicked. No, 
It's the Kenai to our evil. It's the very offspring of the serpent that are evil. But what did we just read back in Mount 9-13? If you're just looking at them, you can't tell the difference. And very few people, only those with ears to hear, know who the Kenites are. They know they claim to be Jews, but they, but they do lie. They're at the synagogue of Satan. They're the very seed line of Satan himself. And what does it say in Matthew chapter 23? We just read it a, a few days ago when, when we read that amazing testimony that Stephen gave where, it, where he said, you are the ones who crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. And it, just, it says the same thing in Matthew 23. It says, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, you, you have murdered all the prophets and all the righteous men all the way from righteous Abel to Zacharias. Well, who killed righteous Abel? Cain did, the very first son of Satan. And through his offspring, they would murder all the prophets and they, they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. So are you aware of that? Do you know the difference? John chapter 8, verse 42, the Kenites came to Jesus Christ. And then they said, we, we be the seed of Abraham. Once again, claiming to be Jews, claiming to be Israelites. What did Christ say? He said, if you were of the seed of Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham. Then what did Christ say in John chapter 8, verse 44? He said, Ye are of your father the devil. The lust of him ye will do. He, was, he is a liar and the father of it. And he was a, the, the murderer from the very beginning. Once again, that first son of Satan, Cain, murdered righteous Abel. And his blood still cries out from the ground. So are you aware of that? Why is this so important? It's because if you have that understanding, the key of David to know who the Kenites are, it opens doors that no man can shut and shuts doors that no man can open. I mean, God's Word says you have to understand this. Jesus Christ taught in Mark 13. He said, learn the parable of the fig tree. Where did, the fig, where, where did that start? Genesis chapter 3. When, after, um, after Eve was seduced by Satan, she covered herself with fig leaves. That's where it began. You have to know what happened in the beginning. And if you do not have, if you don't have any debt, if you don't have the understanding of Genesis chapter 1 through 6, then you're, you're just going to wither away. You're going to let the deceitfulness of riches choke you. You're going to let when someone comes and persecutes you, you're going to just fall away. But if you have the key of David, you know what happened in the garden. You know that Kenites are in the world today. Then you have that key of David that gives you the truth. And he even opens the door to give you understanding to know that it is the false Christ that comes first. It is all intertwined. The truth of God is so pure and so simple. But you see, some people are just too holy for God's word. They're too religious. I know that you're not because you have eyes to see and ears to hear. Let's go into the verse, verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. That word try means to test. Once again, remember what we read a little bit ago? God's going to separate those who play church from those who truly love Him and study His Word. God is sending the false Christ to test you out. And what is that word? Um, keep. It says, I will keep you from the hour of temptation. you got a lot of people say, oh, they're right there. That's the rapture. You're going to be flown away before it ever happens. No, what does that word, what does that word keep mean in the Greek? It's tereo. It means to guard by keeping the eye upon God guards you from all deception. He said in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4, the Satan and the fallen angels, you can't even touch those that have the seal of God in their forehead. Those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. And I mentioned it before, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Satan is being cast out onto this earth to make war with those who keep the commandments of God and those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They're not being flown away in some rapture. That's a complete lie. And that war is all about deception. It's spiritual war. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood. But the war is against principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. Are you ready for it? Have you studied God's word? Do you have ears to hear? Verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Remember, this is Jesus Christ speaking. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Well, what did we just read not too long ago? It said, if you hold on to what you got, God's going to pour it out on you abundantly. You hold on to that truth and you share it. Verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. 
They shall go no more out and be right there serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. You know, there's a lot of people that they want to fly away. Where are you going? God's coming here. New Jerusalem is coming here to this earth. And now the entire world will be rejuvenated and will be brought back to perfection. And you, you will be made a temple, and you are you will be made a pillar in that temple. You learn in Revelation chapter 21 or 22, I think it's 22, that says there is no there is no temple actually, but Almighty God and the Lamb are the temple thereof. And you hold them up. How? By you sharing the truth to others, by you standing against Satan. And ultimately being delivered up before him and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through you. Now we're just going to go a couple more verses. Skip down with me to verse. We're going to go verse 18. We're going to finish out this chapter. Five more verses. So skip down with me to Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. And it reads, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich with the blessings of God. Of course, remember your deeds are, are go through the fire. And in white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eye with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Do you know how you anoint your eyes with eye salve? You ask Almighty God for understanding of the Scriptures through the Holy Spirit. That's how you do it. Remember, this is counsel. This is Jesus Christ giving you counsel. How do you, how do you buy that gold tried in the fire? You don't go buy anything with money. You study God's word. What does it say in the other church that God was pleased with? Smyrna, Revelation chapter 2, about verse 7 through 8. God says, look, I know that you're poor, but you're rich because you have the key of David and you have the understanding of God's word. So you anoint your eyes with the eye sad, meaning you study God's word. But every time before you study, you ask for eyes to see and ears to hear and for understanding from the Holy Spirit. Not just for your sake, but so you can share with others. Verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. I mean, you serve God with vigor. You be very bold when you teach it, and because you know it's true, you study it from God's Word. And God corrects those that He loves. So you repent when you sin, and then you, you have that clean slate until you sin again. But you do your very best to never sin, even though that's impossible. But you do your very best to serve God to the very best of your ability and to stay away from the ways of sin. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And you, you know, you really need, I'm not going to go there. You really need to go read Luke chapter 12 about verses 35 through 38. You know what it says there? It says when Jesus Christ is knocking, you better open to him immediately. And it says, blessed are those who are watching. Because Christ comes at a time when most people aren't expecting. Remember in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says he comes as a thief in the night to most. Why is that? Because almost the whole world is going to think he's already here. Because they've already taken the false Christ as their Savior. So blessed are those who are watching. You read, you take that time to read that. Luke chapter 12, 35 through 38. Verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. I mean, is that the best thing you ever heard or what? If you overcome, you stand against the false one. You're going to be right there next to the throne of Jesus Christ. You're not sitting on the throne. Almighty God is. But you're going to be right there. That's why it said... Back in, back in a previous verse, it said that they're going to come and worship before your feet. Not because they're worshiping you. You're right there at the throne of Almighty God. Because you didn't care about this world necessarily. But you cared about serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And standing against the wicked one. Verse 22 to complete. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So once again, do you have eyes to see? Do you have ears to hear? Do you understand God's Word when you read it? Do you ask for that understanding that He can give it to you so you can share it with others? We learned these past two studies, there's a whole lot of people, they don't have eyes to see, they don't have ears to hear. You can lay the truth right out to them and they just don't understand it. And that's fine. Why? Because since they don't have the truth, 
It's, remember John 15, it said, if, if they have the truth, there's no cloak for their sin. There's no excuse for it. So God blinds many for their own protection, so they cannot, they cannot commit that unforgivable sin. Now there's two more places I'm just going to mention. We're not going to read it, but I want you to make a note of it. Another place that have to do with ears to hear. One is Mark chapter 13, verse 14, where it says, Let him that readeth understand it. And it says, When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that you get out of Judea, letting us know it will be Jerusalem where Satan, where Satan will set up his throne. And the last place I'll mention is Revelation chapter 13, about verse 9. Somewhere between ver about verse 9 and 10, Revelation 13. Once again, it says, He who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And that's that chapter that tells you about the, that there will be a one world system. That Satan will arrive on earth and he will perfect world peace. He will perfect the one world government. But it says, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. You understand. Then after that, it tells you that Satan will, per that Satan will perform miracles in the sight of man. He says he can make fire come light. He says he can make fire come down from heaven whenever he wants to deceive those that dwell on earth. So are you going to be deceived? Do you take time to study God's word in depth, learning all the way from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation 22, the whole Bible? understanding what happened in the garden, understanding that the, that the seed of the Kenite is in the world. Why is it important? We just read it. It opens doors no man can shut, shuts no, doors no man can open. When you have that key of David, to understand that there are two seed lines, the seed of David, which is Christ, and the seed of the serpent, which is Cain. But most importantly, remember, your job, like it says in Mark 13, when you see the abomination of desolation, your job is to be delivered up before Him, not premeditating what you will say, but allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through you. That's your destiny. Blessed are those who have ears to hear. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for ears to hear and for eyes to see. and We just thank You so much for Your Word, for, for giving us the understanding of the mysteries of divine secrets when we seek it out, when we take time to study Your Word. We just thank you so much for giving us this church that we have a place we can come and share your word exactly as it's written. With no apologies, but just teaching it exactly as it's written. We thank you for that honor and privilege. And we just ask you to continue to give us understanding as we study your word. Not just for ourselves, but so we can share it with others, Father. We love you so much. In Jesus Christ, Yeshua's precious name, amen. This is recorded June the 24th, 2020. At Smyrna Christian Church, 1623 North Purdue, Kokomo, Indiana. Come join Pastor Jesse Sisko Wednesday, Thursdays, and Fridays at 7 p.m. and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. God bless.